is Hillary singing hallelujah. Whew. And uh, uh, I heard, a, uh, I, I'll just pass this on to you. Um, um, Leonard Cohen interviewed on, uh, or, no, a review of his latest recording, which just came out three weeks ago. I heard it on Fresh Air this week, and uh, it is an amazing album. It's like Johnny Cash's last album, uh, with that kind of depth to it. Hmm? And David Bowie, yeah. But it, it, like, it's dark, like Johnny Cash's was, and, and uh, it's about approaching death. And then three weeks later, he's, he, he did die. Okay, that's off the subject. <laughs> Back to the announcements, the uh, practical things. Uh, evaluations will be sent to you by email, and we hope that you will return them <clears throat> because they're very important for planning for the future. Uh, the video, uh, the videos of our, uh, all of our sessions will be put up on YouTube and the, on the website, they're already on, on YouTube, but uh, to get to them quickly, you can go to our website, uh, lakejunaluska.com slash peace, and there will be a link on the website to the videos, and, and it's, it's on there now. All right, great. Uh, name tags, these little things cost 50 cents a piece or something like that. So uh, if you'll turn them in as you leave this morning, uh, uh, we will recycle those babies, okay? Phil Bentley is the moderator for our panel this morning, and uh, I'll turn it over to Phil. We are so glad that you are here. Thank you. Um, as usual, I'll start out with a few extra words uh, because uh, the passing of Leonard Cohn hit me very hard. Uh, he's been kind of an inspiration to me. I used to sing his songs. I well, still do, actually. But this last album, the, You Want It Darker, is the name of the album. And that song uh, is, in many ways, musically, a departure. His voice was, was gone. I mean. Nobody's going to be singing this song around a campfire. Um, but in it, he uses a word that's actually in the Jewish lectionary for this week, which is the part of Genesis. It's really about hospitality. It's about, uh, it starts with uh, Abraham receiving the three angels, who he thinks are travelers, and um, uh, ends, more or less, almost ends with uh, the sacrifice uh, or near sacrifice of Isaac. And, you know, if you're reading a translation, uh, God calls on Abraham, and Abraham says, here I am. Well, the Hebrew word is hineni, which is exactly the word a student would use when you're calling the role in a Hebrew school classroom. But in the Bible, and particularly Abraham, here I am, is a, a, an existential statement um, that has great impact there. And uh, Leonard Cohn is saying, here I am, Lord, I'm hineni, I am ready, Lord. And then recites an English translation of the beginning of a prayer for the dead, the Kaddish. Um, and uh, as with Johnny Cash and as with David Bowie, and if you don't know David Bowie's last album, also a meditation on death, and the, the video for his uh, album, uh, David Bowie's, is actually in a casket. Um, so uh, it's been an awful year for those things, but also a wonderful year because you see being ready to go is important. But what I really want to point out is for all of us that that Hebrew word hineni, here I am, I'm ready, um, is so much at the heart of being ready to do what needs to be done. And if you say hineni, God, um, then you're acknowledging that you're doing what you hope it is that God wants you to do. Okay. 
We are, um, when you have a closing session, usually, usually when I moderate a panel, I, I, I prepare elaborately with questions and uh, uh, structure, and this is, I decided not to really structure it, uh, but to ask our three panelists two questions, which are kind of, well, at least one of them is the obvious question, and the other may or may not be the obvious question, uh, and, and see how they respond, and uh, they're giving us a certain amount of time, so after each of you has an opportunity to make a statement, uh, let me tell you what the questions are, and I'll say a couple more words so you can cogitate. Two questions. One, the usual question is, what would you like the participants in the conference to take out into the world with them? And I do feel like I'm leaving a retreat in this, this year. I never felt that before, but this year I feel like I'm leaving a retreat and going back to the world as it is. Um, the other question is, what are you taking away from this conference? I don't know that, that panelists and speakers always get asked that question, but and I, I think it's a, it's a good question to ask. And so, very free form, um, do any of you have an answer to those questions to start off with? All right, there's an idea. Then we have a chance to think about it. Do, do, uh, it, David, it is right. It will help to do a centering song, and that's yeah, that's usually the way I would do these things. So we already know the song from yesterday, which uh, I have also taught in interfaith settings. Uh, I'm going to start a little lower than you did because I, I will please. not <laughs> hit them. So either you're down there with me, or you're just like the national anthem. <laughs> Avana shira, shir alleluia. Avana shira, shir alleluia. Avana shira, shir alleluia. get started. Uh, I mean, one thing that I would take back for myself is you, right? The encouragement of knowing that there are people who came together who see this as a really, really important matter and are committed to doing the work. Uh, this is immensely encouraging because we need encouragement. So now what, what would I want to, to leave for you all I think it's clear that we're at a time where we have to, to think clearly about what our work is for. It's a time when clearly people are distracted and frantic in their activity in all sorts of ways. And people are starting to wonder, what's it all for? Why are we doing everything that we're doing? And you see this obviously intergenerationally. We see a lot of people, younger people, who are saying, We've seen what our parents and grandparents did. We're not interested in that, which I take to be really encouraging because it's what we as an older generation have done that has put us in this really, really difficult position now. And so to, to join with 
the millennials, if you want to call that the, the crowd I'm talking about, and say, we want to listen to you in asking the kinds of questions, what's all of our busyness for? Right? Why are we so obsessed with more things, with an ever-expanding economy, when we know that this is doing so much damage, not just to the planet, right? It's very clear that our economy is tanking the planet, but it's also doing so much harm to ourselves. I mean, we carry the injury in our bodies, in all the stress-related conditions, psychic and uh, physical maladies that we're facing. And I think what we have to help us theologically is immense in precisely this kind of a context. And, and given that this is an interfaith uh, meeting, I want to draw especially on the Jewish gift to the world, which is the Sabbath. Christians need to recover what this teaching is about because the Sabbath is fundamentally the question about what it is all for, right? Why do we do all that we do? And it's so important to remember that besides being the fourth commandment, the Sabbath as presented in Genesis 1 and 2 is the fulfillment of creation, right? Abraham Joshua Heschel, who I think has written the best book on Sabbath, says that all of our striving ought to be toward the Sabbath and all of our action ought to flow from the Sabbath, which I think is profoundly right because the Sabbath orients us. Now, when we say the Sabbath ought to be the orientation in our lives, we have to understand that the Sabbath is not simply about stopping. It is about rest. And sometimes we think that rest is simply about not doing something. And I think that is to sell it short. It is important not to do some things, but the Sabbath is fundamentally about helping us understand that our restlessness is fundamentally the problem. Okay? The opposite of rest is not simply activity. The opposite of rest is restlessness. And by restlessness, what I mean is a basic discontent with our condition, with where we are, with what we're doing. We're not happy with where we are, with what we're doing. And so we do more. We think we have to do more. But the Sabbath is precisely God's first rest because God looks out onto this freshly made creation and sees there God's own love made material. And so God does not want to escape. God does not want to check out. Instead, God fully becomes present to what is there in the mode of delight in the mode of tranquility. And so what I would hope that we can do as we leave here is help people, the people that you know, but then also if you have a platform in which you can engage larger groups of people, is present them with this question. What is all of your activity for? Is all of your activity life-giving? Is it community healing? Is it world healing? Because if we come to people simply with our attacks on why you're not working for climate or against climate change, I, I think you're going to lose a lot of people. But if you can approach them with things that are fundamental to who they are, where you say, what do you want your life to be? What kind of a life do you want to see for your children and your grandchildren, the people you love? That opens up a space, I think, to have some conversation that we're currently not having and need to have. And using the Sabbath as just one way, I mean, there are other scriptural places that we could go, but the Sabbath is certainly a powerful place that we can go and ask people, how is what we are doing, how is the way that we are living now contributing to the health and the gladness and the joy of the places, the creatures, and the people uh, that are in the places of our own lives? Right? I think this holds forth a vision. And then, and this is not just to say the Sabbath is all sunshine and light, because there are, remember, two commandments that two times we get the Decalogue. And in the first one, it takes us back to the creation, but the second one takes us to the Exodus. Right? It's about liberation, the Sabbath is. Right? If the love of God is what we are to delight in, when we see the love of God being denied in our world, a Sabbath sensibility requires us to call out that oppression, 
because the Sabbath is fundamentally about bringing all of creation to praise and blessing in God. And if we can help people understand this, I think we may have the chance of asking questions that maybe people aren't asking enough, but perhaps want to engage. Because I think all of us deep down want to be able to say, the life that I have lived was worth living. Norman, what you said was too interesting, and now I have to remember what I was going to say. Blah, blah, blah. Well, first of all, this is the first time I've taught anywhere in the South. Uh, <laughs> Welcome, y'all. <laughs> and also the first time I've ever hung with a large group of Methodists. <laughs> So these were good experiences. Um, I'll tell you, seeing how much my thinking seriously about Jesus meant to you all was a big deal to me. It means a lot. And it makes me want to go deeper into that. So I appreciate that also. Um, What do I want to add or contribute for you to take away? I think I want to sum up sort of the thesis of my book in a certain sense, which I alluded to in a bunch of ways in my talk. But the question is, how can being in the image of God be something that is a gift to creation instead of turning creation in a gift to a, into a gift for us? Right? So my thought about that I'm going to give this to you in a, in a way that I hope is easy to remember. Yes. There's a midrash that says that uh, not only were we, created, were we created in God's image, but God showed us a special love by telling us that we were created in God's image. That is, God could have created us in God's image without telling us. And this suggests something to me, which is it may be that other things are created in God's image even from the perspective of the Torah, without it being said so. That is, the Torah is written for us, so naturally it tells us this important information. And that one of the things it means to be like God or to imitate God is to look at another being and say, you are the image of God. God does that for us as a gift. We have the possibility of doing that for each other as a gift, to look at each other and say, you are the image of God. And that is not just a gift given to the other person, the di a divine image seen in the other person, but it's what activates that holy image inside of us. Right? We become like God when we say that to another person. So the same way, when we look at the world around us, when we behold it with godly eyes, then also I think we can be, or perhaps should be, compelled to see the world as the image of God, and to say to the creatures around us, you are the image of God also. And that in doing so, we become, that is what it means to be the image of God, is that, that, that is what it means to fulfill, to live up to the image of God, to behold creation with the eyes and the love with which God would behold creation. And if we could do that, there's so many things we would never, ever do. Yeah. So I think that's, I wonder if that's a challenge or an invitation that can work even for people that think that climate change is a hoax or people that are um, evangelical in that Gnostic, with that Gnostic twist that Norman was talking about, to try to behold the world with God's eyes in that way. This works both ways, by the way which is I'm striving to look at the lake and the flowers and this and that, the creatures I encounter, and say this is the image of God. But also, there's a kind of awe that is inspired by the natural world around us, what um, David Abram calls the more than human world. I like that term because it includes humans. But in the more than human world around us, a kind of awe that we even if I see a person and I say, that's the image of God, I don't often see that level of awe in when I look at them. 
yes? So I want to be able to look at a field and see God's image, and I want to look, be able to look at a person and feel the awe that I feel when I see the Grand Canyon. And if you really think about it, it each of us merits that kind of awe. But it's easy for us to get used to each other. So always there's this sense of wanting to reach that next level, to see each other through God's eyes. One of the things I think it means to imagine what it, what it is to, I'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't sound, for me as a Jew, idolatrous, but to see things as God would see them, because of course we can't really do that, is that nothing ever becomes normal or average. Everything is, every atom, not just every person, not just every species or flower or lizard or whatever, everything is absolutely unique and known fully in its uniqueness in all the depth that it exists in. We can't know things that way, but we can at least remember that things are that deep when we look at each other, when we look at the world around us. So I hope that um, at least that's something you can take away from this conference is to to reach for that level. Yeah. And I thank you so much for inviting me here. Okay. Thank you. I'm very moved and I don't know what to say. First of all, what I'm going to be bringing back with me this being my second visit to Lake June, Alaska, is a lot of gift of love to share. When we come here, we feel so powerfully how much you all care. <laughs> and I'm going back to New York State, right? <laughs> And a lot of people that I know in New York are really scared now, really terrified now. And it's a great temptation to try and see the world in the kind of split artificial categories that have been imposed on it by this turn of events. There are people at home who, who are very tempted to believe that there's all kinds of people out there that want to kill them. And I suspect, you know, that that's part of uh, where this huge reaction that we've been looking at recently came from, too. I mean, when I came down last year, some wonderful people came up to me and said, oh, I wish you'd come and visit me. I, I remember one woman, she said, I think I'm from Mississippi. And all the people in my congregation think the Mus Muslims are going to come and kill them, just like that. We have hallucinations like that. And one of the things that I think is really important to do is to calm each other with the reality of our human presence. And when I told my friends I was going to be coming down here, they said, oh my goodness, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, I'm going to ask him what's going on, and then I'll be able to tell you. <laughs> and it's very reassuring to be able to say, people are people. Don't be deceived. So there's that. The other thing I'd, I'd really like to pick up that I think my, my colleagues have been picking up and articulating in different ways you know, at the beginning of my presentation to you yesterday, I gave uh, a wonderful verse from the Quran, which is, wherever you turn, there's the face of God. That's tremendous. And if we look at things that way, then fear disappears. All remains. Right? 
fear disappears. And there's a saying from one of the greatest of all Sufi masters, Ibn al-Arabi. He passed away and to the mercy of the Lord in 1240, but he's still very current. And he said, the human being is to God as the pupil is to the eye. So can we feel ourselves in the midst of that function? You know, I think one of the things that's troubling us right now is that so many people feel like nothing. They feel like nothing. And because they feel like nothing, they think it's somebody else's fault. Because once upon a time, we remember we used to feel like something. <laughs> right? So maybe what we really are in the, in the intention of God can fill that emptiness that is making so many of us so dangerous in desperation and despair today. But in order to transmit that to people, we have to feel it ourselves. Can we look at our own selves with the mercy of God? Can we do that? And then, inshallah, with the will of God, can we turn and look at each other? I'm going to be working on that one, too. OK. So now, I want to uh, add to that uh, for myself that I have felt like this is a retreat from all the tumult of the world. I have not turned on the news this whole time. And I, I, I have felt this, these few days as a time of healing for me. And I think there are maybe others who share that. And as for the question of what to take with you is to take an understanding of our relationship to creation, to the world, to be able to say, Hineni, here I am, and I'm going to do something. And in a little bit, we're going to have something about what to do. But I just wanted to put my own thought in, because this, I, this is my sixth or seventh uh, Lake Junaluska Peace Conference. And uh, it, it, it's been very special to me among all of them. Uh, we didn't have a Nobel Prize winner. We didn't have a, a Marianne Wright Edelman. We didn't have, you know, I, but there was just something about the spirit that I felt here these past few days. And I hope I can take that home with me. Now, let me ask if you have any things to say to each other. I hope this is not our last encounter. But then we have a, a, a little time. How much time do we actually have if I ask for comments or questions from the attendees? Um, well, OK. Yes. I, I really would certainly say the same thing. <laughs> Um, also, I'm excited to, for, for, for Norman and I to get to talk because of his work on the Sabbath, which is so important to my work as well. So that's a real pleasure. And, and Rabia reminds me of how much more I want to learn about Sufism and Islam. 
Yeah, this, this was just fabulous to meet two new colleagues. So I am delighted to share this knowing of them with you. So yeah, it's been great. I'm sorry, I forgot to use the microphone before. <laughs> Anybody else want to speak? Wow. Today is the uh, Christian Sabbath, I believe. I haven't watched the news either, and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like to put it in terms of the, one of the great gifts of the Jewish people to the world is the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, I know we're talking about getting back to our media, uh, to our cell phones and our newspapers um, and uh, our political buddies. Um, and I'm uh, impressed this week with not having those contacts. Where do I get my truth from? Uh, and a mm -hmm. lot of the truth was spoken to me, so I appreciate that. Good. Ah, good. I can actually say something and people might hear it. I want to thank you all very much for your time, your effort, your knowledge, your wisdom. It's been very, very informative. And I think the, um, the, the topic, the uh, climate crisis and peace is very appropriate, seeing what's happening with people migrating from um, Africa and uh, the Mideast towards the northern climates. Um, one day it may be our turn to be in their, be in their shoes. Thank you. Being sort of a hyper Wesleyan, having advice, do all the good you can, all the places you can, with all the people you can, all that stuff. It's great to hear words of renewal and understanding each other. But what in the world are we going to do with one of the worst crises we've faced, the whole world has faced? And I'd like a little more practical advice where a person of faith who wants to get engaged next week, where do I go? Uh, we're actually prepared with some answers for that, so <laughs> be patient. Please. I mean, a lot of where to go is local knowledge, which of course I don't have for you. But I do want to hold up one thing, which is that we need to be prepared to mourn and grieve for what's happening and love and celebrate and act. I think I already said this, but I want to emphasize it. That is, um, despair is not an option, but grief is a necessity. And so we need to find a way to make that uh, highest priority uh, so that we can move through it, so that it can be an emotion, something that is in motion, rather than a state which overtakes us. So one practical thing that you can do is this. I, it's customary to say, join a group. Eh, OK. The thing I would say is we live in an anonymous economy. And what that means is, we don't know the stories behind anything that we buy, right? We have been made the most ignorant people on earth because we don't provide for ourselves the things we need to live, okay? That's just the truth. So one thing that you can do practically 
is start to learn the histories of some of the things you buy, whether that be your food, your clothing, your energy. Don't try to study it all because you will be overwhelmed very quickly. But try to understand the history of some of the things that you buy. And after you've learned the history, decide if you can still buy it. Because you may discover that there are other ways that you can buy, or you may discover you don't need to buy it at all. Okay? That's an immensely practical thing to do, and you start to do this in conversation with other people that you invite with you to try to do something like true cost accounting of our lives. I find I want to put something out there, too. This is more directed, I think, to the immediate political situation, but you know that's going to have a lot to do with the long-term view. People need to have a sense of who we are. I was talking about this before. And one of the things I think that we're seeing is uh, a, an attempt to make an identity out of stuff. And the focus of our problem right now around this is white people. I think that what passes for white identity now is a kind of amnesia filled in with a lot of junk. We need white people. We need to ask other white people to tell their family stories. We need to remember where we came from, who we are, who our parents were. I was very inspired by all of these people over this weekend who were going out and interviewing the elders in the mountains. This absolutely has to happen. Where's your grandma from? If you don't know, can you find out? What's her story? Who was she? Because then you have some, something to share with people who have another story. You have a story to trade. Right? You have someone to be other than a consumer. We need to have an identity that's not just about being a consumer. I'm going to take the, phone, the microphone one more time. Uh, two things. First of all, compost. Why is that so important? Not just for all the good environmental benefit but also because the earth has given you something through the hands of other people that gives life. And if you throw it in the trash, you're mixing it with batteries and bleach and things like that. It's the same as what happens to the water when you frack on, that on a certain level. Things that are living want to be part of life. So take that which gives you life, the part that you don't use, and make sure that it continues to give life in other ways. That's the one thing. Second thing is I, I want to put a question to Susanna. Is there a way to at least prevent the very worst person from being the, becoming the head of the EPA? Is there a way to prevent the Paris Climate Agreement from being completely destroyed and ruined? Are there enough Republican senators that actually believe in science that we can, you know, push them to p put up some resistance? What do you, what can we do about that? No pressure. Okay, I'm going to let Susanna jump in here because we also have the opportunity for networking in a conference like this, and Susanna is a, a, it's a hub of a network and uh, can share with uh, some of those things. So answer his question first. <laughs> You're going to owe me. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and I'm excited to have an opportunity to speak in a little bit as well about our challenge and our call to action. So there are very, very practical ways that I hope each and every one of us will leave this retreat um, and begin uh, as soon as we return home. And um, there are lots of opportunities. Now, the answers in the short term is that um, immediately after the election uh, was announced, uh, there were, as you can imagine, um, rapid response gatherings all across the world. Um, both uh, what was taking place in Marrakesh with the, um, the, the, the ratification and discussion of the Paris Climate Agreement. And then here in the United States, we have uh, what is known as the Climate Action Coalition, which is a coalition of 
hundreds of groups. Um, and fortunately, um, we do have faith-based representation in that network, um, which I'm very involved in. So I did sit on a call, and um, we are working on a plan uh, in the next, that we have to actually get better than ever um, by the next 70 days, because there is a mas massive um, mobilization taking place to hold the new administration accountable within the first 100 days of, um, of this transfer of power. Um, and there is a lot of detail in that. So there are very, very, the brightest and best minds are on it. Um, but our call, and I'll speak more to this in a bit, is um, it is absolutely critical that we respond as a moral imperative. That language is what is going to move and change the hearts and minds. And indeed, there are conservatives uh, in our Congress and in the leadership of this country and around the world that have felt, we spoke last night at dinner with Norman as well, about the work that his daughter is doing um, with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And there has been a House resolution passed giving safe space for conservatives to um, to move on climate action. And they have told us behind closed doors that it is the environmental movement and the language of, if I may say, holier than thou, um, that has pushed people to become climate deniers in a political way. And so we need to minister to them and give them that space to um, speak their truth. And so there is great, great possibility and opportunity. And thank you for that opportunity to share that, and there's a lot more that'll come from that. <laughs> so. And we probably need to get into the next part of our program. Okay, I have been given a list of, of names, uh, people who speak briefly about things you can do, because for a conference like this, we must go from the spirit to the mind to the body and uh, from, from believing and thinking to doing. So I'd like to first ask for Ibrahim Saber on composting. Oh, you need the microphone. Um, so yesterday um, in the circle discussion, uh, I mentioned that I've been involved in a compost project. Um, and then I was asked later on to uh, speak about it. So basically, uh, just like uh, what you said, uh, compost is really important. It's, um, it's basically, instead of making new ways to fertilize the land, and by actually fertilizing it, we're killing it with more pesticides and ammonia and whatnot. Using what we actually eat as fertilizer is just an amazing idea. It's just, once I was introduced to it and I thought it was possible, I was just like, why don't everybody do it? I mean, we eat all the time. I mean. We're gonna go for a lunch in like a couple of hours now, and then we're gonna have immense amount of waste. And then no matter where you go, in every institution, school, university, everywhere, there's so much food waste. And it's just that idea if we can like live by it or actually like, introduce it to our to the kids, it will it will make a great difference. So. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, a, a question was asked about whether there is a composting project right here at Lake Journalistic Conference Center. And I think, I think I heard you say that you tossed a banana peel into the garden. Yeah. <laughs> um, Connie Gates is going to tell us about the Center for Sustainable Climate Solutions. Yes, a word from my sponsor. I'm here, <laughs> I'm here representing the Center for Sustainable Climate Solutions, which is a new initiative at Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, and it, works clo it will work closely with the EMU's renowned Center for Justice and Peacebuilding. So my uh, sponsor wanted me to make sure that you understood the connection because of, of the theme of this conference. So I'll just read quickly this so I don't uh, waste time. And I have extra copies of this and more information. Um, there's no website yet because it's so new um, that they haven't gotten that far. But um, 
So the, are there any Mennonites here, or any Anabaptist tradition people? Oh, hey. We have to work on that. <laughs> oh. Yeah. OK. Um, so the vision is to joyfully respond to God's call to be stewards of the earth by mitigating the causes and adapting to the effects of global climate change, first in our institutions and then the broader Anabaptist faith community and beyond. Its mission is to create a center to serve as a catalyst and integrator for this work, to connect, research, educate, and innovate together, and be invitational to other Anabaptist organizations to join in this effort. The center will stimulate and motivate our commitment at all levels. It will be a visible statement to the larger world that Mennonites are serious about climate change. Collaboration with other like-minded groups and organizations will create an impact felt much beyond Mennonite circles. The work will focus on four areas, connecting with the national and global network, researching best practices, educating by sharing findings, and innovating through new ideas and methods. The, um, this center uh, was stimulated by a generous donation by my friend Ray Martin, and his contact information is on here, and he's the one that will be uh, coordinating the initial contacts until they get um, staff and more organized there. So um, I'll put these on the uh, registration table in the back where other materials were. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't have a person's name here. Uh, the Narrow Ridge Earth Literacy Center. There you go. Okay. We wait for the. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Oriana, and I've spoken with a number of you just casually since I've been here. I do live and work at Narrow Ridge Earth Literacy Center in Washburn, Tennessee, which is only an hour and a half from Lake Junalaska. And I would encourage any of you who live in this area to make a little trip over the ridge and come find us. Uh, Narrow Ridge was formed 25 years ago by a now retired uh, Methodist minister, Bill Nickel, who many people in the room know. Um, we exist on three pillars of spirituality, sustainability, and community. Uh, we own a land trust of a little over now 600 acres, which we protect. And uh, our, our charge is to educate and demonstrate those three pillars to anyone who comes to visit us. And we invite and uh, fortunately receive regularly a significant number <clears throat> excuse me, of college students. So we have relationships with major universities like Notre Dame, um, like uh, Miami-Dade College, which is down where I used to live, and uh, University of Tennessee, and bring students in regularly, um, and students that may be anywhere in the age range from zero to 100, uh, but also collegiate students specifically, for them to spend an alternative spring break week with us and uh, get off the grid and get away from their electronics because we don't have any connectivity there anyway. Um, <laughs> and we have an organic garden where we teach them to garden. Uh, we all demonstrate our homes. We all live off the grid. And uh, it's a wonderful way for them to see that there are other ways that you can live that are not sacrificial in any way, but they're beneficial. So. I guess my message to you all um, from today and these last few days is that when you attend something like this, oftentimes you go home in two different ways. One, feeling so overwhelmed that you don't know where to start. And or two, feeling like you have a specific call that you've received that you need to go home and start a new program and do something special. Um, and I would encourage you to do neither of those two things. Uh, the right thing, I think, to do uh, is to go back into your community and find what already exists or is trying to exist that could benefit from your energy and your resources and your thinking and devote yourself to that rather than start again from scratch because as we can all figure out, if you have only a pie that's that big and you keep slicing it more finely, you end up with a piece that's so narrow that it doesn't accomplish anything. So that would be my message to folks, to go back home and, and find who's already doing what you're interested in. 
Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Mayor Ridge uh, is fortunate enough to have, I believe, the only certified green burial preserve in the state of Tennessee. Uh, we started working on that five years ago, and it's been officially certified for a year. So we offer our site to anyone who wants to be buried there or wants to bury a family member there in the way things were done back in 1916 that we saw yesterday. Um, so no chemicals, no preservatives. Uh, people are buried in the ground in a shroud or in a, a biodegradable container. And um, then the grave sites themselves are marked with a flat stone and wildflowers. And as we close off different areas of the burial preserve, it will be allowed to go back to nature, and then we bury in, in other parts of it. But yeah, and anyone can come. We don't charge for a burial there. Uh, the only thing that the only charge that's related to that is to dig the grave, but we don't charge anything. You're welcome. This is probably a good transition into our closing. Uh, can we give the uh, panel and uh, a, one, a round of applause again? Thank you. So that's two intentional communities that have been there. Yours and ours. That's a big part of American history. You know that. Got me. We on here? Good. All right. Good morning. Do I have the go ahead, Frank? All right. Did y'all enjoy David and the lightning bolts last night? Yeah. Together us this morning, I'm going to play one of my favorite hymn tunes. I'm going to play it because of some things that were said. And it's not so much because of the words, which some of you will know, but um, it's a song that is sung throughout the Christian world now and is a... Um, uh, my name is Scott. 
Yes. Or as the little children call me, Mr. Scott. So <laughs> the rest of it. Yeah. Hey, you works too. Um, this is a song that was written down the hill in Spartanburg, South Carolina, many years ago.
Please join me for the morning acclamation as found in your program. Each day the first day, each day a life. Each morning we must hold out the chalice of our being to receive, to carry, and to give back. It must be held out empty, for the past must only be reflected in its polish, its shape, its capacity. And for those things which for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask, vouchsafe to give us. Amen, amen, amen. You can listen or join in, whatever makes sense to you here. Let the circle be wide round the fireside. And we'll soon make room for you Let your heart have no fear There are no strangers here Just friends that you never knew We will travel along on the wings of a song With a mind that is open and free If we close our eyes to the other side We're just half of what we could be let the circle be wide round the fireside And we'll soon make room for you Let your heart have no fear There are no strangers here Just friends that you never knew Shake the hand of the man from the far distant land Meet him and treat him well And the young girl so fair with the wind in her hand She's got a story to tell Let the circle be wide round the fireside And we'll soon make room for you Let your heart have no fear There are no strangers here Just friends that you never knew There are songs to be sung There are rafters to be rung There's a reason to rise in your bow There are stories of old And new ones to be told To carry away when you go Let the circle be wide round the fireside And we'll soon make room for you Let your heart have no fear There are no strangers here Just friends that you never knew so we'll pass the bottle round and we'll drink another round that our friendship may always remain for how can you tell when we say our farewells when we shall all meet again let the circle be wide round the fireside and we'll soon make room for you let your heart have no there are no strangers here, just friends that you never knew. I'll go for it. Join me in our litany to our common cause. In an era of planetary crisis, we as people of faith are coming together. Our concern for justice, freedom, and peace demands it. And what we can learn from each other requires it. People of faith, we have begun to listen together to the spirit within our varied and venerable traditions. And so which spring forth from our teachings of each of our faith traditions. We join together as many and diverse expressions of one loving mystery for the healing of the earth and the renewal of all life. 
a sense of the sacredness of the individual person and each one's conscience, sense of the value of human community and our role in the interdependent web of life, a realization that might is not right, that human power is not self-sufficient or absolute, and that our trust is in something greater than ourselves. A belief that love, compassion, selfish, selflessness, and the force of inner truthfulness in the spirit have ultimately greater power than hate, greed, and inordinate self-interest. A sense of obligation to stand on the side of the poor, the hungry and the oppressed, and to serve the cause of eco-justice for all. A profound hope that good choices for all of life finally will prevail. Because we affirm these convictions held in common, we also affirm one another in our different religious and cultural expressions. Because we affirm our differences, we also affirm the validity which we bring to the common cause of living in harmony with all existence. Because we affirm our role in the world, we also affirm our commitment to stand together as a unified force for its social and moral benefit and to be a symbol of living together in diversity on behalf of all of life. Good morning. My name is Angela Dove, and I am happy to be here and to uh, help Scott out this morning. Before we get to the meat of the matter, there are two extremes on the spectrum of musical creation. On the one end is composition, which is, in the history of humanity, a relatively new invention, where the composer has total control over what note is played and when. On the other end is complete randomness of sound and silence. This music is called aleatory. And then in between is improvisation, where the best laid plans meet the inspiration and the chance of the moment. An improvisation on creation. In the beginning, there is silence. Silence is not a problem to be overcome. Silence is the canvas. The artist must love silence before anything else can happen. The artist brings forth a theme. It is simple and honest and reminds me of the theme from Miles Davis's So What track on the album Kind of Blue. Deep and full with possibility, but mostly simple and honest. A bass line is figured out, and a lonesome fiddle takes the theme. A banjo claw hammers along. A singer sings about moonshine and getting saved. Bach plays along. It is good. Improvisation transcends all. The glory of this moment cannot be overstated. The glory of this moment and all moments, past and unknown, cannot be overstated. This is miracle. This is beauty. Our theme must inhabit both spaces both beauty of death, both miracle of new life, the mystery that both of those are the same. Our theme must inhabit those spaces for the sake of its own evolution. As one variation dies away, a new one is born. Our theme is a short story by Norm McLean about how all things merge into one. It's a poem by Gertrude Stein. It's a rose, I suppose. 
It's a quatrain from the Rubaiyat. Come fill your cup now, for tomorrow we, like this theme, will die like snow upon the desert's dusty face. It is the sigh that is too deep for words. And that is enough. But it is not over. Improvisation struggles to find an ending. That's why it usually just fades away. We can't hear it anymore, but it is still exploring all possibilities, especially the impossible ones. Our theme is both the dishonest prayer we make in public and the private prayer that we can only feel and never hear. Our theme is the hand that shakes a hand today and slaps a cheek tomorrow. Our theme is both the march to war and the gentle walk in the woods. Our theme is the disenfranchised hillbilly waving a flag of hate and ignorance at the disenfranchised black man. Our theme is both a peace sign and a middle finger. It is all harmony, it is all dissonance. Or rather, it is the understanding that dissonance is also harmonious if you listen hard enough. It is a complicated thing, this simple theme. It is good, it is enough, and it is not finished. Above all, there is no variation that hath not its utmost source in that original, simple, an honest theme. And all notes, even the muted ones, are traced back to the loving mind of the artist. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to begin by thanking Frank and Boyd for uh, giving me this opportunity to deliver a message this morning, even after my insistence was that I did not, <laughs> did not want to be in this position because there are so many uh, capable clergy in this room that uh, I don't often have a, a chance to... Um, to deliver a message to so many clergy. So it's, it's exciting, but also a little nerve wracking. <laughs> but thank you, thank you for this opportunity. And I appreciate the question that was posed about um, what are some of the practical applications that we can all take home as we move forward into the world um, after we leave this beautiful space and place. And um, that indeed is my message that I have to share. So um, I'll just briefly introduce myself. I'm Susanna Tuttle. I serve on the staff of the North Carolina Council of Churches, which um, for those of you that live in North Carolina and are Methodist, whether you know it or not, you are a member of the Council of Churches. And um, we are relaunching our reinvigorated uh, role uh, to play in the state um, as a moral imperative. Uh, we just launched a campaign that you will hopefully be seeing and shouting <laughs> and sharing, uh, which is uh, separating church and hate since 1935 when the council was uh, instituted. We actually predate the National Council of Churches on that. So. Um, lots to share there. The Interfaith Power and Light campaign, uh, some of you know, is a national uh, an, uh, initiative. We have um, groups in 40 states, so if any of you uh, are living in a state where you are not aware of or perhaps an IPL does not yet exist, um, I really look forward to helping to foster that. Um, I'm particularly working in South Carolina right now to launch that initiative. So um, there's a lot to share, and I have some information out in the other room. I also want to draw attention as you uh, leave this space this morning. Um, we posted up in the back of the room 
um, some of the examples of the exercise that we did yesterday in two of the workshops um, that was called grokking, um, or uh, thinking about our actions in a new way. And I will be compiling and putting what is on those post-it notes into an electronic format that we will share with all of the participants um, because we really hope, and I, I feel very inspired. This is my first um, peace conference, and I look forward already. Right when I got here, I was like, I can't wait to come back next year. <laughs> and, um, and I want to make a commitment to all of you. For every empty chair that you see in this room, um, I hope, and if you will pray with me, um, to fill that with a, uh, a person uh, under the age of 40. I think this, <laughs> so that is um, very exciting. Um, there is a wonderful national conference that takes place in the woods of um, Hot Springs, North Carolina called the Wild Goose Festival. I've been very involved in that for the last two years, and I think this is an, a beautiful partner um, event to um, to marriage with that. Uh, so I, we, I have a lot of work to do in that charge, but um, thank you. So I have some prepared words, and then I'm going to give some um, just comments because I want to move forward uh, quickly with this, but also hopefully inspire some ideas and thoughts about how we can continue this conversation. And as I said in our breakout sessions yesterday, um, my hope is that with each of you that I look into your eyes today, that I get to see you next year, and we get to talk about what we've done since the last time we saw each other. So throughout this conference, I have learned that many of us have spent time with the words and meanings of Laudato Si, Pope Francis's encyclical released just over a year ago. We recognize that we are being called back to our true identity as children of God, to live in right relationship with God and God's creation, to repent of our wrongs and turn back to what is good and true and beautiful in God's sight. This 2016 Interfaith Peace Conference has reinvigorated the encyclical's prophetic quotes on our call to action. And I quote, Many things have, have to change course, but it is we human beings above all who need to change. We lack an awareness of our common origin, of our mutual belonging, and of a future to be shared with everyone. The basic awareness would enable the development of new convictions, attitudes, and forms of life, a great cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge stands before us, and it will demand that we set out on the long path of renewal. As I read through the encyclical, and if you haven't, I hope that each of you will take the time in this coming year. We recognize that climate change is not just another issue to move up higher on our list of world concerns. Rather, it is the concern central to all other issues. Which brings us to our common call to action. The climate crisis challenge is calling for us to be what we are calling the three Ps, prophetic, pastoral, and indeed practical. So it's that practicality that I think each of us are really ready to dig into after uh, these many days of retreat and respite. And I'm going to put those three Ps into another threes. Um, which is our opportunities to be practical in the ways that we worship. I have had the opportunity recently, because of my uh, political and policy advocacy, to uh, engage with a more conservative Christian community. And I found myself on a lot of Christian radio talk shows of recent, <laughs> which is very interesting and challenging, but, um, but thrilling. And what I realize is that um, it, it is important to come up with the stories and the actions uh, that make the climate crisis real to us at home. And so one of the acts that I uh, offer to each of you is an, truly an act of worship. 
And it's something that many of us have an opportunity to do in a variety of ways from the moment that we awake in the morning. I would imagine many of you are like myself, where um, the first thing that we do is look at our cell phone when we wake up, <laughs> because for me it has the alarm on it, and so then I turn it off, and then I sort of scroll through it, and then I begin to prepare for my morning. And usually, uh, I've used that time while I'm sleeping to also recharge my battery of my cell phone. And so when I awake and I get ready to move into the next room of the house, I am very intentional about unplugging that cell phone charger. And I do that not just to save energy or to save money, but truly as an act of worship. I give gratitude for the energy that came into my home so that I could recharge what is a very constant companion in my life these days. But I also do it in a way that is a, a, a kind of atonement and in a recognition and an acknowledgement of what I've just done while I am asleep. And then I go to my coffee maker, the next room in my house, <laughs> and I brew that cup of coffee. And it is that moment in space that hopefully each of us give ourselves a little bit of a break before we rush out into that world, that busyness that Norman spoke to. And um, when I take that first sip of that wonderful coffee, fair trade, I hope, <laughs> I then go over to the coffee maker and I give thanks. And I unplug that coffee maker in an act of worship. When I do that, as I move into my car, because I have to commute to go to my office, before I actually turn on the ignition, no matter how hurried I am or where I, how late I usually am <laughs> about where I need to be, I attempt to take a moment in an act of worship and give gratitude for access and the ability to go to my office and my place of work. And throughout the day, I just find more and more, and it's so exciting to be able to see that almost everything that I do, and a lot of times it is in that act of apology or prayer, but it is that intention that I carry with me throughout the day that I find the entire day becomes, it's, a, it's as though I'm in, in worship. So it's really shifted my uh, quality of experience throughout the day. And as I share these on, you know, even with a very conservative population or whomever, um, it rings true. And it's, it's been, a, a, I've seen transformation happen in the hearts and minds as I've shared these stories. So I offer to you those just practical acts of worship throughout the day. The other area is within food. And through my program, we realized, and I'm going to talk about energy briefly in a moment, but we realized that um, energy can be a very esoteric way, entry point into discussions around the climate crisis, and that food is truly the natural uh, connectivity point within communities of faith, all communities of faith. And so we have designed a program that we are calling Sacred Foodscapes. And much like the name of our program, Interfaith Power and Light, which often I have to explain, no, we are not a utility company, but it is a play on the concept of the power and light within each of us. And the sacred foodscapes language, when we're thinking, and I love that word grokking because I learned that word here at this conference, of, of a new way of thinking about our relationship to the world. And I have found in communities and with children and, and children of all ages that we can imagine a landscape. We do have a sense of some sort of memory or, you know, every one of us, if I said, imagine a landscape, they would all look different, but it would be a place that you knew how to go to. And so what we're asking now is for us to imagine what our foodscapes look like. And the monocrop, incredible lack of intention around caring for those foodscapes and where they are in relationship to where we live and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my partner uh, with Creation Care Alliance of Western North Carolina talked yesterday about how um, Georgia 
previously being known as the Peach State. Well, now South Carolina is the Peach State. And soon, North Carolina will become the Peach State as the climate shifts as we move forward. And so these foodscapes that we need to connect to are invoke imagery, and they also invoke direct connection. So making that food, faith, climate connection is something that I offer back to you and your communities to have these conversations, to imagine, just pose that question, what is a foodscape, and how could we talk about that, and how is that sacred? And then third is energy, which for whatever reason in the world, I would never have guessed this when I was in seminary, because I... Uh, was one of those folks that spent a lot of years thinking about the nature, point, and purpose of our existence, never occurring to me when I walked out of that room of deep, deep thinkers who was going to turn the light off at the end of that conversation. And I just realized when I was when I graduated from seminary, I my first job I was hired as the first sustainability research associate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and was in a meeting, and they said, we want you to, you're so good at working with people and understanding behavior and culture. We want you to work with the faculty and the staff and the community of the university um, and figure out how we can automize our HVAC systems so that we can have more engagement from a, a, a occupancy, and they went into all these languages, and I just wrote down H-V-A-C and circled it. I was like, I probably should learn what that means. And, <laughs> and I had a lot, a lot of learning to do. Um, I had never been a homeowner. I, I just I did not know what those letters meant, and I was in you know, my late 20s. And so I have spent the last decade not only learning what HVAC means, but how when we think about where to enter into the practice of creation care, one of the best places we can start is by practicing the care of the creation that we actually made as human beings, which is the built environment. And that creation that is ours, if we don't take responsibility for it, that, that will be the end. If we don't even care for that which what we have made. So I offer you this, and I am so passionate about this, and I am, I feel like, you know, you get these, these callings, I certainly get a call to go to ministry, and then you continue to get these callings throughout the day. And um, I do believe, I'm going to profess something to, to each of you that I haven't said publicly before, but I do believe that I am pulling on a thread right now through my work with congregations across the Southeast and nationally and internationally. There is a huge opportunity. We truly, and I hear this from our secular brothers and sisters quite often, that it will be communities of faith that turns the ship, this great ship that we're on. And... That gets really overwhelming when people are pointing the finger at us, telling us that that's our role to play in, in this time and space and place of our story. So what are the practical applications of that? What do we do? So I charge each and every one of you to go back into your houses of worship and find, if you are not the person or you don't even personally know the person, we need to be identifying champions within our congregations who are going to begin to do the analysis and understanding of how much energy these buildings are consuming. We have no idea. No one has any idea, I've asked. The utilities have no idea. And I say this as an opportunity, as our, our great work our great challenge and our great opportunity, because we can do this. We can do this. Every single one of our buildings, unless you're completely off the grid, is connected to the grid, which means there is a source of energy that is powering that building. There is data. And again, you might not be the person who loves to look at data, but there probably is somebody in your congregation. And if there's not, I will personally volunteer to help you look at your data. Because what we can do is redesignate 
congregational facilities as a unique building type on the grid. I don't know if you know this, but all of our congregational facilities in the country are zoned or in the rate paying structures as small businesses. When I tell clergy and other faith leaders about this, they get pretty offended, actually. They're like, we don't have a profit margin. How are we a business? We're, ba we're literally passing the collection plate to keep our lights on right now. And you can pretty much be assured that the people putting money in that collection plate hope that it's not going to pay the power bill. But as I began to study this and look at the immensity of dollars and money that is going in to the system to pay for all of these images that we have seen over the course of the last three days, it's just, it, it's so inspiring to me. And the idea is that I'm going to move forward and leave you with, hopefully in great inspiration, is in the same way that you can log in, create a profile for your home, and begin to look at your energy consumption, we can do that for congregations. We have to do that for congregations. And so as we begin to do that, we begin to understand how, when, and why we consume energy in these buildings. That why, I think, is my favorite part. But how and when is really important, because here's the deal. If we're designated as small businesses and there's no box that was checked when that building went online, whether it was in the early 1930s or you have a brand new um, fellowship hall that came online last year, if there's no box or no unique designation for that facility in the grid and they think you're a small business, how do you think these energy companies are projecting the amount of energy that we need to consume moving forward and that we need a new nuclear plant and we need to build natural gas plants, plants and we need to tap into the tar sands because we're going to need all this increased amount of energy, especially in the southeast where people are moving quicker and faster than ever before. So the utilities are saying, we're going to need so much more energy. Why? How? When? Small businesses, that's not what we are. We need to know who we are, what we are, how, when, and why we consume energy. And that, to me, is the greatest opportunity because there is more square footage of congregational facility space in the country than there are hotels. We think about ourselves and the masses and the numbers and the millions and millions of people that we could engage. And I just see from the two years ago when I was at the People's Climate March in New York City and we had our whole own block in downtown for faith leaders and we're getting ready to have the next People's Climate March in Washington, D.C. in April, which as soon as I get the, it's April 29th, I did remember to check last night, April 29th on a Saturday, that we will come together in the masses of faith leadership because we know what we're doing. We actually have an action that we're taking, that we're coming together and understanding. And if we can systematically stop any kind of new electricity being generated for a facility that is not going to use it, because when do we use energy? On the nights and weekends, primarily, unless we have a day school. That whole baseline, that notion, that peak energy during the middle of the day, we're not using it. And I'm hearing about solar panels that are installed where they're dumping the electricity because they're generating too much energy that they, that's actually not being consumed. So anyway, you can see I'm really passionate about that. <laughs> I'm working directly with Duke Energy um, to talk about this new unique building type, what that would mean. It, but it, it, it requires every single one of us to be involved because they're not going to do it. We have to ask for it. And as our customers to our electricity, that is where our power and light exists. So I think I went on too long about that, and I'm not going to get to talk as much uh, about our advocating with compassion pedagogy that we've developed. But um, R Rabbi David gave me a little opportunity to talk about the public policy advocacy work that we do. And I'm just going to be really brief and say, um, actually, I'd love to see a show of hands really quickly. How many of you have had a chance to meet, you, personally, uh, any of your elected officials? Excellent. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm leaving so much more inspired than I even thought. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. Because that is so, it's never been more important ever 
and um, our call to action as we move into this new administration um, is to absolutely do everything you can as a community member of and as a person of faith to introduce yourself, make sure they know that you, who you are, and, um, and begin to build that relationship. It's going to be tough. We have um, whole trainings where we teach people how to do this because it can be really tough if you find yourself to be on an opposite uh, political side of, of who's representing you. But it begins with building that relationship. And we don't need to be the experts on the policies. That's not what we need to be talking about. We need to be what, we, what I refer to as the what I love campaign. We need to be sharing what we love, talking to our elected officials about what they love, and then finding where that, that bridge and meeting point is. So I um, will close, because I think I've used all my time. But um, I want to just remind us that should anyone challenge you about environmental issues not belonging in church, let me assure you that they do belong here. Earth ministry belongs here right beside love, peace, and justice. We are the ones who must lead the world in protection of the very thing that sustains us not for political reasons, scientific or economic reasons. While those matter, we need to lead because protection of the environment is central to a religious life, and we are the institution that has forever stood for justice and peace. So I close with the words of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the 20th century philosopher and theologian. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Hallelujah. I'm going to leave you with a song, and then I regret that I will have to leave you to go be part of one of those congregations. <laughs>
Would you join me in the litany of commissioning and sending forth? Grant us a spirit of concern for the future of our environment. Bring an end to the exploitation of the Earth's scarce resources. Encourage us to honor and come into right relationship with all life. Grant us a spirit of respect, recognizing the value and integrity of all creation. Encourage us to be accepting of ourselves and others. Help us become advocates of peace, bringing an end to conflict and division. Renew our commitment to challenging the causes of injustice. Grant us a spirit of openness to see the good within and around us. Help us to rejoice in the good we have experienced as we move toward to the future. Help us to use our senses to celebrate beauty and creativity in, our, in the world. Grant us a spirit of truth to recognize failings which have hurt us, others, and the world. Give us the humility to ask forgiveness for our part in any wrongdoing. Grant us a spirit of generosity to reach out in trust to those whom we encounter. Help us to embody divine love in our relationships with one another and with all life. Okay, Has Scott left the building? I believe I am not going to lead you in a song. <laughs> I was going to uh, send you forth... Uh, with an Irish blessing, may the road rise to meet your feet, may the winds blow gently on your back, and may the warm rains fall softly on your house. But after hearing uh, Rabbi David talk about his first trip to the south, I'll end with a North Carolina blessing. Y'all come back again, you hear? <laughs> <laughs>